Well, today I have the opportunity of talking about prayer. And this is going to be a three-week series about prayer. And the title of this series is Prayer Points. Um, There's different points about prayer throughout Scripture that are really important. I just felt like the Lord, the specific season we're in, the Lord wants us to lean into prayer and to learn more about prayer. Uh, John Ortberg, in his book on spiritual disciplines, he says this, My hunch is that of all the spiritual disciplines, prayer is the one that people feel the most guilt about. How many of you have ever felt guilt about your prayer life? Yeah, I have too, okay? Somehow it seems that if we really love God, prayer should just flow out of us without effort or discipline. In fact, this was not even the case with Jesus' first followers. That's interesting. And I think he hits on something super important. He alludes to this important fact that Jesus had to teach his disciples how to pray. Now here's the thing. I think sometimes we think that when Jesus was teaching his disciples how to pray, it was the first time they were learning about prayer, but it wasn't. They grew up in a culture where they knew how to pray. And for some of us, we've grown up in a culture where we know how to pray. Yet, Jesus still had to teach his disciples how to pray. And it wasn't just a one-time deal. It was a pretty consistent reality. Here's the thing that we need to understand. If, we, if you want to become a great person of prayer, you need to become a great student of prayer. You need to become a great student of prayer. The disciples already knew how to pray, but they still had to learn more. And they said in Luke 11, if you remember this, they say, Lord, teach us how to pray. They were eager to learn more. And they realized when Jesus prays, like, things look different. When we pray, things look the same. Why is that? And it led them to ask Jesus to teach them how to pray. And I really believe that we today need to learn how to pray. But we never graduate from learning from Jesus. Sometimes we have this idea of, I'll learn how to pray, and then I know how to do it, and then I'm good to go. And we don't recognize that even the disciples weren't operating that way. It was a continuous learning. And carrying the Christianity of Jesus is an ongoing endeavor of learning. It's apprenticing Jesus. He is our teacher, and he's constantly downloading into us ways to grow. The moment we stop learning from Jesus is the moment we stop following Jesus. And I know that's a bold statement, but I think it's very true. To follow Jesus is very dynamic. It's something that I have to step into each and every day, each and every moment. It's not just a one-time decision. It's something that I have to live into and really embody in the way that I trust him and I talk to him. And I see everything through the lens of the kingdom of God. So when I stop learning from him, and I kind of just assume that I kind of know everything, I'm not following him, because there's always more to learn. So you may have kind of picked up on the topic for today, but it's all about humility. It's all about humility. And we're going to dive into all these different parts of humility, but I think for us, it's so important that today, and every day after today, we become students of prayer. So I want to invite you into praying a prayer with me. Uh, I'll, I'll pray one line and then just you guys can repeat it. Um, sometimes I just pray over us, but I think today it's an important opportunity for us to step into partnering with God and praying for ourselves that the Lord would teach us. So you can just go ahead and pray after me. Father God, I am open to learn something new from you today. Will you teach me more about prayer? Will you teach me how to incorporate prayer into my everyday life? Pray this in your name. Amen. All right, so go ahead and turn to Matthew 6. Verse 5 is where we'll start. But all of Matthew 6, if your afternoon is kind of free, read it all. It's really good. Uh, I mean, we could be here for days and days and even years unpacking Matthew 6, um, but we won't do that today. But Matthew 6, 5, the reason I start here when it comes to prayer is that 
Jesus is the perfect representation of the Father. So if we want to learn how to pray, we should go to Jesus to learn how to do that, okay? In Matthew 6 is the text where Jesus outright teaches his disciples how to pray. But before we get to the Lord's Prayer, uh, I want to go start in verse 5. It says this, <clears throat> And when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the streets, that they may be seen by men. Assuredly, I say to you that they have their reward. So what's their reward? Their reward is that everyone's seeing them do it, okay? It's more about them than about actually hearing from God. But you, when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who is in the secret place. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they will be heard for their many words. How many of you have ever done that, you know? I remember growing up in church, and I just try and copy what everyone else is doing, which isn't bad when you're learning, okay? But it's not going to sustain you, okay? Um, And then it says in verse 8, Therefore, do not be like them, the hypocrites, for your Father knows the things you need before you ask him. When I read this scripture as a young young, young man. Some of you would still consider me a young man, so I have to say, like, when I was like 12, okay, a few years ago, um, I would read that, and I'd think, well, if God already knows what I'm going to pray for and knows what's in my heart, what's the point of prayer? I guess I don't have to pray, you know? Like, that's like, that's real, real spirituality. Like, he already knows we're kind of good. I don't need to pray. But it actually alludes to a super important point for each one of us to recognize prayer isn't just about doing something and getting results, okay? Prayer is about communion. It's about relationship, okay? So my wife and I, we can oftentimes finish each other's sentences, okay? And we know what is on each other's minds. Um, We can literally walk into a room and tell each other is sad, mad, happy, whatever. But just because that's a fact, Does that mean that we shouldn't talk at all since we kind of get each other? No, that'd be weird. That'd be really weird. The thing is with God, he already knows what's going on inside of us, but he is so relational that he actually wants to talk to us. And that he wants to commune with us. And his desire is that we would know him in a very personable way. So our first prayer point uh, for this morning is this. Humility is the foundation for all true Christian prayer. Humility is the foundation for all true Christian prayer. Without humility, there's a couple of things that we step into which aren't good. Uh, Without humility, we build religious activities that quench the Holy Spirit's work. We become busy, but ineffective. That's what these guys were doing. They were doing prayer, and they were reciting things, and they were making statements, and they wanted people to see them. And I can guarantee they were really busy, but it wasn't effective. Because they saw that the purpose of prayer was prestige, and not relationship. Prayer is all about relationship. And prayer should change me every time I engage in it. Every single time. We can become busy, or noisy, but not known, okay? And here's the thing. So without humility, we become noisy, but not known. Here's, here's kind of what I mean by that, is these hypocrites, these leaders, they were saying things and doing things, uh, but they weren't in community. Because they saw their primary job was to look a certain part, but not actually connect. But it's when we're humble before God and humble before others that we can actually enter into community. And I think that's really important for us. But without humility, we become convincing, but not convicted. Convincing, but not convicted. We can become really good at reciting the things of God, but it's actually not doing anything in us to change us. That's really dangerous. Because the the, the challenge with that is we can actually gain a following pretty quickly, because we're really good at sharing something, but we're not really good at experiencing the reality of the kingdom in our own lives. And God is all about transformation. And the way he works, it's never from the outside in. It's always from the inside out. It's always from the inside out. True transformation often takes a while to notice in somebody. Because the Lord's doing something internal 
that's not external yet, but eventually it becomes that. Without humility, we compare ourselves to others. How many of you compare yourselves to others? Yeah. How many? It, it, it kind of can weigh you down, right? We do it in so many goofy ways. Um, you know, we can see the car we have and the car someone else has, and we're like, oh man, that's not, like, I have, my life is terrible, you know? Or the dreams we had for our life that didn't happen and somebody else experienced them. And we can find ourselves comparing and comparing. And the reality is, it's not good for us. And comparison is one of the biggest time wasters. The religious leaders, the Pharisees, they were comparing themselves. And here's the thing. On the outside, they looked put together, and they looked prestigious. They looked like they had things going for them. But I could promise you, on the inside, they're miserable. They're miserable. Because when we walk in pride, we don't walk in peace. So the thing is, if, if you want to experience perfect peace, you experience peace in the person of Jesus. That's the only way to experience it. Because otherwise, it's all situational. Without humility, we promote our own agendas. This is a fun one, okay? But we go into every conversation hoping to get our point across. And if we're honest at times, we go into conversations saying one thing, but trying to manipulate through that thing we're saying. And the, the Lord wants the motives inside of us to be so pure. And it doesn't happen overnight. The way it happens is we recognize that our, our motives are impure, and we, we bring it to the Lord and we repent. We say, God, you know, I thought I was doing this for the right reason, but now I realize why I was doing it. You know, I've shared this story before, even recently, but feel led to share it again. Maybe it'll encourage one of you today. But I started off as a worship pastor. And I remember Katie and I, we went to a uh, Hillsong concert outside in Chicago, and it was awesome. But I just had my arms kind of folded, and I just wasn't enjoying it. And it was such a big concert and such a big, like, thing. And everyone else was engaging, and Katie was like, what's wrong? And I was like, honestly, I just can't worship if I'm not the one on the stage. I didn't realize that was bad at the time to say. I didn't. Yeah. And Katie was like, "That's pro- as a worship pastor, that's probably not a good perspective. And she was 100% right. I wasn't ready to hear it, okay? So I just doubled down. I was like, but you don't understand. I realized in that moment I was jealous of somebody else's success and that I wasn't able to be in the spotlight. It took me years to realize how twisted my motivations around worship were and how counter that is. But the thing is, you can't promote heaven's agenda and your own agenda at the same time. One must bow to the other. And a lot of times what we're doing is this. We have heaven's agenda and our agenda, and we're trying to run them together, side by side. And we find ourselves living a very dualistic life, right? And what God has called us to do is to take our agenda, bring it under the lordship of the Lord, so that heaven's agenda can come into our lives, and our agenda becomes his agenda, what he cares about. That's what it looks like to follow the Lord. And the starting point for that is humility. Our next prayer point is humility positions us to hear from God. Humility positions us to hear from God. It's hard to hear from God when we're so busy worrying about our appearance, what others think, how good or bad we look. I want you to think of King David. Even when he was anointed to be king, while Saul was still technically the king. All of his brothers come out, and it's like, whoa, like he's tall, whoa, he's strong. And God is like, nope, nope, nope. And then Samuel says, do you have any other sons? Oh, well, there's one out in the field. I didn't even bring him in because I didn't think he would be, you know, qualified for this. And the Lord says, man looks at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. I look at what's going on inside. And we recognize that humility positions us to hear from God, where our heart's at. God's desire is that we'd have a beautiful relationship with him that is built on actively hearing his heart actively hearing his heart. But we have to be open to receive. Hearing from God 
It requires us to attune our ears to hear the voice of the Lord. So often we're busy with our own things going on and we, we have our own goals and all these things we're bringing to the Lord and we just want him to bless what we've already decided we're going to do. And the Lord is like, that is not humility. Humility comes into the presence of God with the expectation that you'll never be the same because of what he speaks to you and then what you obey him in. Jesus taught his disciples to do a couple of simple things. Like some of the things Jesus taught was kind of confusing and if you have to really study it to understand it. But then there are other, are other pieces of what Jesus taught and it was very straightforward and it just meant what it meant. Jesus taught his disciples in the scripture we just looked at. You can check it out. But he said basically three things. Break away from the crowd. Pray in secret. Be rewarded from God. Break away from the crowd. Pray in secret. Be rewarded from God. You know this scripture in some translations, it says like go in your prayer closet and pray. And sometimes what we do when we read scripture, we're like, okay if I'm going to do this whole thing, I need to have a closet at my house that I can go pray in, okay? And then our family is like you guys are so weird, you know? Um, the thing is, don't get, and I've, I said this recently, but don't get stuck on the form. It's the heart behind it. Um, so often we're so focused on building our public Christian persona. And we want that to grow. But our, our walk with the Lord in private is suffering. And it, it's, it has nothing much going on there. And I don't mean that in a judgmental way. I actually want you to find freedom in that. Because what the Lord invites us to do is to actually focus on the private life so that can expand and it can spill into the public life. Okay? The challenge is, even in Christian culture, that's often not celebrated. It's often not celebrated, okay? We want to grow fast. We want to grow things big. And we want to have the most and we want to have the best. But the Lord is looking for people who in the secret place just want to be with him. Let him worry about promotion. In fact, he never is worried. But let him figure out the promotion pieces for you. Let him figure out where he wants to place you. You just need to be responsible for doing what Jesus literally taught Break away from the crowd, pray in secret, be rewarded from God. Our next prayer point. The greatest reward we receive in prayer is intimacy with the Father. Intimacy with the Father. Now, this is really important, and there's a lot of implications to this, but so often when we talk about intimacy with the Father, all the men kind of check out. Like, oh, I don't need that. Intimacy with the Father, that's not for me. I just want to encourage you, especially if you're a man, you need to have intimacy with the Father because it's his identity that you will experience as you're close to him and connected with him that will actually enable you to be a leader, enable you to stand strong and to lead your home and lead your family. You need to be so connected and sensitive uh, to the Holy Spirit and prioritizing that. You really do. It's through intimacy with the Father that we become confident in who he made us to be. We become confident in who he made us to be. So often we look to the people around us to be the source of our confidence, which is great when the people around us are encouraging us and happy with us, but is, is terrible when people have issues with us or don't like us or are jealous of us or whatever. And the Lord has a much better way for us to find our security and our identity. It's to look in who he is, find ourselves so caught up in what the word he has declared over us so that when we enter into friendships and relationships, we actually can give something away versus need them to be God to us. Insecurity is a byproduct of distancing ourselves from Jesus who is the doorway to the Father. It's when we embrace, and I love this scripture, again, read it at home, John 15, when we embrace that kind of lifestyle of abiding in Christ, that we experience the full breath of heaven in our lives, and we produce Holy Spirit fruit. Again, it's so uh, countercultural. We think of, if I want to produce Holy Spirit fruit, I just need to go and produce it. We don't recognize naturally 
that it's through relationship and surrender and find ourselves in the presence of God that he does the production. He does the work in us and produces the fruit. All we have to do is make sure that we're in the right spot. We need to make sure we're in the right spot. He's that good. He's that gracious. It's through remaining in Christ that we can experience fruitfulness. So now we get to the point where Jesus teaches us how to pray. This is known as the Lord's Prayer, and I love that, and it is the Lord's Prayer. Um, but the, the problem with this prayer, how many of you grew up reciting this prayer? Yeah, a lot of you. The thing about something that becomes so familiar is that sometimes it can lose its power in our lives because we don't reflect on what it actually means. Um, and my prayer is that the Lord's Prayer would be like a compass for your life. I think it is a deep prayer, but it's also deeply simple in helping us understand what matters most in life. So let's read it together. Matthew 6, 9. It goes, in, it goes and says, In this manner, therefore pray. I'm just going to stop there for a second. It says, in this manner. Some of you think that when you go to pray, you have to literally read the Lord's Prayer, and that's what it means to pray. But what Jesus is highlighting is the heart of the kingdom of God. So in this manner, kind of pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. Some of you don't recognize that scripture because you only learned it in the King James. So I'm sorry, okay? There's more than one version out there, okay? Um, but I love that at the end, and we're not going to get into it, but at the end, it's all about forgiveness. What's that tell us? You can't step into prayer if you're not willing to step into forgiveness. Totally different message. We'll save it for another time. But here's another prayer point. Jesus taught his disciples to pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus taught his disciples to pray for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. So God's will, okay, let's talk about that for a second. A lot of times I will talk to people, and it's not just through talking to people that I learn what they believe, but when they actually pray for things that I learn a lot. Have you ever prayed for somebody and said, God, I pray that you will heal uh, Johnny's ankle today, if it's your will. That is a security blanket that we built in a lot of times because we have felt disappointment when we prayed for somebody and they weren't healed. But what that symbolizes is that God's will isn't to heal sometimes. Okay? Here's the thing. When Jesus came to earth, died on a cross, okay, rose to new life, and is seated at the right hand of God. When he did all of those things, what did he defeat? He defeated death, sin, and the grave. He defeated those things. So it would not make sense for God to partner with those things if he literally sent his own son to destroy those things. Okay? So what is God's will then? Okay? Well, God's will is for the earth to look more like heaven. Now, when we pray for people, are they always healed every single time? No. Why? It's the mystery of the kingdom. We don't fully understand. But what we, we don't do and what we shouldn't do is make up new ideas that Jesus never taught. God's will is for God's goodness to spread across the earth through his people. For forgiveness to flow as freely through us as the blood of Jesus flowed for us. I want you to think about that. Forgiveness is a big deal when it comes to prayer. So much so that Jesus would always talk about it. Like, leave your, your stuff at the altar and go make things right with a person. I had a few people this week that I needed to make things right with, so I was making some phone calls before today. <laughs> You know, seriously, because I realize as the Lord, and this is a thing, the Lord brings stuff up in my heart, and I'm like, oh man, like, I can't preach this if I'm not practicing this, right? So the question then becomes, we know God's will is to bring heaven to earth, but what is God's way to accomplish his will? 
We are. We are. Matthew 28, 18, it says, Jesus spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Wow, that's a lot of authority. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So what is Jesus doing? He is commissioning his disciples to carry on his ministry and for the earth to look more and more like heaven until one day Jesus comes and all things are made new. But we don't stand hopeless today. We actually play a part in bringing heaven to earth. Because if we were hopeless, Jesus would have said, all right, don't do anything. Wait patiently until I come back. Live scared. Live defeated. Hate everyone. Jesus didn't say that. He said, go. And literally, the power that I have, I am giving to you. You're going to see even greater things. You're going to see things that you never even had an idea for that were in my heart from the foundation of the earth. So as we study the Lord's Prayer, we see that it is just so full of humility because it's all about seeking God's will for the earth in everything we do and not just our agenda. I believe today God's calling us as a people, as a church family, to set down our agendas and never pick them up again. And I don't know what your agenda is. I don't. I know what mine is. Sometimes my agenda is like security and feeling like safe and feeling all these things. I don't know what your agenda is. Maybe you have a political agenda. Maybe you have an agenda of how you want everything to look and what needs to be true about this church for you to be happy with everyone. The reality is we need to set those things down and say, God, I want to carry your agenda. I want to be like a herald for your kingdom. I want to serve you with my life. If I realize that there's anything that isn't in alignment with your kingdom, I'm stepping into repentance so quick, so quick. The only agenda we should be carrying is God's agenda for the earth. It's a kingdom agenda where Jesus is king and we are his people. Sometimes people ask, like, what is your vision for the church? Well, for Jesus to be king and for us to be his people. Well, how are you going to reach the community? Well, tell them about Jesus being king and invite them to be his people. Like, there's so much power in the authority of Jesus. Like, I think sometimes we, we look at Jesus as kind of like, you know, a crutch, and he's not a crutch. He is the king of kings, And at the name of Jesus, literally everyone has to bow. Every authority has to bow. So the big idea for today is this. Humility is the key to unlocking the blessing of heaven in your life. And I hope you know that when we talk about blessing, I feel like you guys are ready for this big idea. Because if if we start with this big idea, humility is the key for unlocking the blessing of heaven in your life. What we can think of in blessing is like, Okay, so I'm going to get a new boat. I'm going to have no problems in life. Uh, Everything's going to go my way. Um, The pastor is always going to teach what I prefer. The worship's always going to be great and all this. And blessing, blessing is not about accumulating more things. I'm not saying having things is wrong, but it is not the goal of life because all those things perish eventually. Blessing is about communion with God. And how does that happen? Prayer prayer. What starts and leads us into blessing is what continues blessing in our life. So prayer opens this opportunity to experience the blessing of God, and it is a cycle where we can continue to walk in that blessing. And I just want to close out with two more prayer points that are, uh, the first one I have taught about at length before, but the second one, as I was uh, praying through this, it just kind of, um, it jumped out to me. So Second Chronicles 7, you've heard this scripture probably before, but starting in verse 12, it says, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. I love that the Lord says he heard Solomon's prayer. I think that's so cool. Some of you need to know today that God hears your prayers. There's no prayer that he doesn't hear. And he says, when I shut up heaven and there's no rain 
or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence upon my people, if my people, here's the if, and the really important if, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and heal their land. I just want you to catch that for a second. He says, if my people, okay, originally they were talking about Israel, but now we've been invited to the whole family, right? We're part of this family. If my people, if we humble ourselves, right, pray, seek his face, and turn from our wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I think the order of this is so crazy, so cool. The first step for experiencing breakthrough is humility, which then positions us to actually be able to pray, okay? Okay. Because if prayer comes first and not humility, what we begin to pray about is just about our expectations on God and what we are telling him he should do. But humility actually opens us to be able to commune with God in a powerful way. So humility is that that doorway into this. And then we pray, okay, and we begin to commune with God. Then we seek his face. What's seeking his face? It's worship. It's worship. Because as we pray from a humble posture, we can't help but worship him. And then what, what does that produce in us? Hearts of repentance. Because what we realize is we've been putting our trust in things other than the Lord. And that's why repentance, it's not a one-time act. It is a daily, second-by-second second reality. Oh, God, I'm feeling so anxious about tomorrow, how that meeting's going to go, Lord. Oh, I'm feeling... And then I'm like, oh wait, I'm rooting, <laughs> I'm rooting myself in a meeting and not in what the Lord has said over me, right? This actually will change your life, you guys. But then it says in verse 15, now my eyes will be open and my ears attentive to the prayer made in this place. When we practice these things, when we're humble, when we're praying, when we're seeking God's face, worshiping him, and we're living lifestyles of repentance, God takes notice. He says, I will see with my eyes and my ears will actually hear the prayer made in this place. For now I have chosen and sanctified this house that my name may be here forever and my eyes and my heart will be there perpetually. That God is just going to be in that place. He loves to dwell in the place where he's welcome. As for you, if you walk before me as your father David walked, side point, David was what? A worshiper. Solomon is learning, okay, I need to be a worshiper like him if I want to experience the blessing of heaven. And if you do according to all that I have commanded you, and if you keep my statutes and my judgment, then I will establish the throne of your kingdom as I have covenanted with David your father, saying, you shall not fail to have a man as ruler in Israel. Prayer point on this text is this. Humility precedes breakthrough. And I'm telling you, I just see it all throughout Scripture. If you want to see God do something amazing in your life, if you want to see things turn around, if you want to see people come alive to God, if you want your family to change, it starts with you becoming humble before the Lord. There's no other way to it. But 2 Chronicles 7.19 gives us a little bit of a warning, and I think this is kind of where we're at as a church. I believe that we have prayed bold prayers, and we have sought the Lord, and we're starting to step into this, you know, relational habit with the Lord where we seek his face in humility and all these things but here's what 2nd Chronicles 719 says but if you turn away and forsake my statutes and my commandments which I have set before you and go and serve other gods and worship them then I will uproot them from my land which I have given them and this house which I have sanctified from my name I will cast out of my sight and I will make it a proverb or a byword among the peoples. How's that sound? And as for this house, which is exalted, everyone who passes by it will be astonished and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and this house? Let's make it a little bit more personal. Why has the Lord done this to the chapel McHenry? Then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and embraced other gods and worshiped them and served them. Therefore, He has brought all this calamity on them. And I don't think that we are doing this yet, but I think there's a temptation to do it. And here's the thing. 
The final prayer point is this. Humility sustains breakthrough. A lot of times we will humble ourselves so that we can experience breakthrough. And God shows up and it's awesome. But then we go back to our old way of doing things. We prefer slavery rather than walking in freedom. What we have to learn is what's it look like to walk in freedom with the Lord. Humility sustains breakthrough. Again, if you humble yourself and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways, if you make that your lifestyle, you not only step into greater levels of breakthrough, but breakthrough is sustained in your life. So we play a huge role in this. So I want to invite you to stand with me. Our worship team is going to uh, lead us in a, a song. And I just feel like the Lord's inviting us. Um, we are in an exciting season as a campus. How many of you believe that? Like this is a really exciting time. Um, and we're seeing numerical growth, we're seeing spiritual growth, we're seeing financial growth, there's just growth happening across this place. But the thing that we need to be aware of is that even though that is true, we have to give God the glory for that. And if we want to see God continue to work in us, and for this to be a place where he wants to dwell, we have to walk in humility consistently. And I I really believe that this is something that you, in a personal way, have to make a decision around, right? So what we're going to do, we're just going to open up the altars today. If you can't make it to the altar, I know there's more of you in here than could actually probably fit around the altar right now. But if you can't make it up front, that's fine. Turn your seat, your area into an altar too. But I just felt like the Lord wants us to repent. And I don't know what it is for you. You know, I know what it is for me. I like being in control. I like knowing how things are going to look. I like all that kind of stuff. For you, it might be a little bit different. But whatever it is, I want to invite you to invite the Holy Spirit to reveal that to you and for you to humble yourself before him, right? Seek his face, worship him, and repent now, but then on a daily basis. Because I really believe the hand of God is on this place, is on you guys. We're seeing God do amazing things. But I want to continue to walk in that. I believe like we're at a really critical point where we have to choose humility to experience the blessing of God in a sustainable way. So I'm going to pray over us and then our altars will just be open for you guys to connect with the Lord, repent, um, have conversation with him. Maybe you're just hungry to experience him in a fresh way. It's a great time to come forward too. Uh, So you're just welcome to come forward. So Holy Spirit, I just pray that uh, these final moments, Lord, would be a meeting place with you. And I pray, Lord, that you reveal things, even things in our own hearts that we have not seen, God. Parts of our hearts where maybe we've even lied to ourselves that were motives that were pure. And in reality, it's just us trying to do what we want to do and then spiritualize it. So God, I pray right now for a deep work of your presence in our life. I pray that you would literally flush out impurities in us right now. Mind, soul, body. God, I pray right now that you just flush out impurities that are in us right now, God. And I just thank you for the work you're doing in this room. I see a room, Lord, that's just on fire for you, God. But you're inviting them to learn what it looks like to walk in freedom. Not just experience it initially, but to walk in it, God. So right now we humble ourselves, Lord. And I just pray that you'd meet us in this place of true repentance. Pray this in your name.